It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. This is Fireside Chat, episode 57. If Jones is in, who's out? Recorded October 27th, 2014. We're 10 games into the regular season, and we're back for another episode of Fireside Chat. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we got a lot to talk about this week. How you doing, buddy? Good. So let's talk about this last week. Uh, The Flames went 1-1-1 this week. Not a bad record. Um, Went Lost in overtime to the Lightning. Of course, they beat the uh, Hurricanes 5-0, and they lost to the Capitals. I think that's pretty predictable based on what the games were. Um, I wasn't expecting a win against the Capitals, nor really the Lightning there. Yeah, that's pretty much how I was pegging things, it, especially against Carolina. Like, they're really bad. We had to get that win. Yeah, they're almost embarrassingly bad. Like, from watching the AHL games thus far this season, I'm fairly confident that the AHL Flames and all the opponents that they've faced could have beaten Carolina. So even though the AHL Flames can't beat too many teams, you think they could beat uh, the Carolina Hurricanes? Yeah, they're just that pathetic. You know, I was talking to a guy at work today, and he's a foreign guy, so he's he's from England, and he's really into soccer, not really hockey. And he was asking if in hockey they have the relegation league like they do in uh, soccer where the worst team jumps down. I said, you know, if that happened, Edmonton would have been in the AHL for years. Yeah, and it's one of those things that you kind of wish that they could do things like that in North America because real dog teams like Carolina, Buffalo, Edmonton, and Florida, they should have some pressure to actually improve instead of playing such poor hockey. Like, it's not fair to either their fans or the fans of any team that has to actually endure watching them play. But you know what, I think for Flames fans, I mean, you know, that was, we got five goals, so I know watching that game, it was kind of exciting to watch your team get up that high, even though they are a crappy team, seeing five goals from the Flames was, I mean, where I was watching at the bar, it was pretty exciting for everybody. Oh yeah, I'm not saying, like, it's a bad thing for our Flames fans, like, the, it was a good game, it's just. You know, you don't want to see a guy like Connor McDavid being awarded to such a garbage team or Jack Eichel or Noah Hannafin. Like, they should go to teams that are at least trying to improve instead of, oh, let's really blow just so we can get the superstar prospect. Yeah, well, maybe there's something the league needs to put in there about, you know, I don't know, some sort of an effort. I don't even know how you'd word that, but, you know, a team who's showing progress moving up maybe that should be more yeah. of how the draft is rated than finish this year yeah well i think that uh, what they should do is actually put up all the top four picks up for the lottery and uh, that way if uh, you have a legitimately bad team you'll still likely get a top four pick but it's not guaranteed you'll get something at least yeah and because like this is kind of bs for fans around the league to have to watch that kind of stuff like i've seen expansion teams play better than that like give me a break (laughs) the flames have a fairly light week this week uh we played tuesday and again on friday so lots of time off there which is probably good for this team and then those are the last two games of their homestand and then they go back on the road uh beginning november so not a lot of hockey to look forward to this week i think that'll be nice i've been especially these last couple weeks with a lot of games i've been finding it hard to watch all the games the way i'd like to so i'm glad there's only going to be two games this week yeah, well, plus I've been watching all the AHL games, so it makes it a little bit difficult to watch a game pretty much every day. <laughs> That's true. That's true. You're at least it, man. At least it's only four this week, so, uh, you yeah, know, it's a lot better. <laughs> you get three days off. Yep. Three non-game days for you. Those are your practice days. Yes. Got to write some articles. <laughs> Got to practice using the remote more efficiently. So, um... Ten games in the season, about one-eighth of the way through, we're starting to see teams shaking down, starting to see team identities forming, and one of the things that we're seeing so far is the Flames are having difficulty scoring against teams that play well defensively. Um, can you point out any specific games for people that are listening who might want to you know, go back and watch them or remember them in their head? Yeah, well, pretty much like the games against Washington, Tampa, St. Louis, Nashville, and Chicago specifically, like all of those teams have good defensemen, 
more or less, and play a rather defensive style. And the Flames just got completely shut down in each of those games, and were only able to score either one or two goals in each of those contests. Like, they have had some success against teams like Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Carolina, scoring 14 goals against those teams, but they're also not very good teams, and the Flames need to be able to overcome teams that can play defense because most of the teams in the league are not Carolina. <laughs> you know, if I look at those teams, though, I don't know if it's necessarily teams that play defense. Those are all just really well-built teams. I mean, they got, you know, good offensive presence, good defensive presence. St. Louis is one of the teams that I think a lot of people think might go deep this year. So I think it's, I mean, they do play good defense, but they play good on all ends of the ice, those teams that you mentioned. Yeah, and... Um... It's one of those things that the Flames need to figure out a way of breaking through so they're not getting shelled like they were in Chicago or St. Louis and be able to put positive puck pressure up the ice instead of always reacting to what the other team's doing. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, it's. I was at the Tampa Bay game at the Dome and they seemed to be reactionary. They didn't seem to be setting the pace. They seemed to be following Tampa Bay and the pace that they were setting. That game was a little weird because neither team seemed to want to actually push through the other team's defense. No, they didn't. Neither team seemed like they were playing all that well, period. Yeah. Probably a game where both teams deserved the loss. <laughs> Unfortunately, somebody's got to walk away with two points, and sometimes somebody else got to walk away with one point. But Yeah. That might be an interesting idea if you have a 0-0 tie of giving nobody a point. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that the Flames need to devise strategies on how to make plays down low and all that because in the last few games a lot of their passing has missed the mark and like especially in the Washington game a lot of their passing like they were trying to set people up in front of the net but like they were just missing by like a foot or two and that's the end of the play. We're seeing that in the Tampa game, too. A lot of guys that weren't looking where they were passing or just passing blindly or getting the puck taken away from them a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Just something that they have to work on, that's all. Yeah, I'm not sure it's necessarily defensive teams, but all those teams are really good teams, and I think that the defense is definitely part of it, but the Flames are probably getting overwhelmed there, and that's probably partly due to the players that were icing as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't have a we don't have a lot of great offensive guys, nor do we have a lot of great defensive guys. Really, you know, good defensive specialists this year. But yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that's something that can be practiced, especially with four days off this week. The Flames might be able to spend some time on that. Well, ten games into the year, we've seen both of the Flames goaltenders playing at this point. Hill and Ramo have both played five games each. Um, they've been splitting the duties as you expected at the beginning of the year, one and one. Any, either one of them standing out as being better than the other to you? I think Hiller has actually stepped up his game. Like, I know before the season started, I was saying that, like, he's not the same guy as he was in Anaheim. And I always try to have low expectations because if they don't perform well, then you're not disappointed that they're not performing well. And he's actually elevated his game quite significantly and is playing more like he did when he first came into the league and that's good on him. Ramo's been a little shaky at times. I'm not as comfortable with him in that lately. Yeah, I think I predicted at the beginning of the year that we we're going to see a bounce back year from Hiller and I think we've seen that so far in his five games. I agree that he's looked like the steadier of the two goaltenders. I feel like he... Doesn't get as overwhelmed is probably the best way to say it. Sometimes we'll see a lot of traffic in front of the net, and it looks like Ramos just getting overwhelmed by it and perhaps not able to you know handle some of that pressure there. But I still think that between the two of them, um, we have a really good tandem this year. They're both looking good. Neither one of them is looking really all that bad. Hiller's record is three and two. Ramos got two two and one for his record. So. Yeah, I mean, still decent records. It's not like one guy has been, you know, getting all the wins and one guy hasn't. No, it, it they're still both starting caliber goaltenders. It's not like Ramos being mediocre backup quality guy. He's doing a good job. It's just Hiller's been a little bit better. That's all. 
Yeah, and I think I expected that. I mean, you know, with Hiller being the senior guy and the guy who, again, needs kind of the um, the boost, if you will, the guy who needs to show that he's doing better, I expect him to come out guns blazing this year and really show that he's still got that. And as much as he may not look like he did in Anaheim necessarily, um, you know, for what this team needs, I think that he's going to do really well here this year. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how a how long they keep up the rotation, and b how the who takes the lead spot. For sure, they can't rotate like this all year long. No, because like that kind of gets a little annoying. Because like if a guy like say like Hiller had that shutout against Carolina, well you would want to reward that kind of effort with another start and. Yet, if you're being dogmatic with the rotation, then, yeah, like that's not a positive thing in the long run. Yeah, no, for sure. One thing that I've thought is really interesting about Hiller this year is his pads. He's one of the few goalies now who's wearing colored pads. Like, most of the goalies want to wear white because it blends in with the ice, and it's harder for shooters to differentiate between the leg and the ice. But Hiller's got these red pads, and they look, I think they look nice when we're at home. But I think that they look awful when we're wearing our white jerseys. Yeah, I don't really care that much either way. <laughs> but it, it's, it's interesting. Nice, it's yeah, interesting it's to nice see somebody to... in colored pads again. Yeah, exactly. It's something different. And you can definitely differentiate the goalies now. True. I think it's cool, too, that Hiller went with the solid mask. When he was in uh, Anaheim, he was known for just wearing his black mask, and he's now got just the red one with a Calgary sticker on the side. Yeah. So just, I don't know, to me it's kind of going old school. The colored pads are old school, the solid mask is old school. It's kind of, it, it's so different to see now that it's it's a refreshing change, if you will. Yeah, I agree. It's nice to see something simplistic instead of overly fussy. Especially with a lot of goalie masks now. Like, they're really complicated and kind of not nice looking. <laughs> Yeah, I think some of these guys, like, they used to always be related to the team. And I remember my favorite Flames mask is still Trevor Kidd's mask. Because I thought it was just, it said Flames so well. And his flaming pads were cool and all that. But, yeah, I just, I don't know. I think that there's too many guys, like you said, who are doing things that are too complex. Or guys who, it doesn't even relate to their team anymore. Yeah. Well, like, if you look at iconic goalies from the 90s, like Ed Belfour and Cujo, like, they had a style, and they kept it. Yeah, they kept it on every team they went to. And you don't see that anymore. Like, no definitive, neat masks that, even if they might change teams, they'll keep the same style up. Hiller kind of is, but, you know, he's a little bit bizarre in his style anyway. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I would much rather see some goalies keep up with a certain look and stick with it. Yeah, I agree with that. I also like, though, the guys that do something really tailored to their team when they get there. You know, like, even having those masks is cool, but, yeah, the guys that will go somewhere, like, you know, Hiller and... Actually, one of the good examples of the iconic mask would be uh, former Flames goaltender Turek, too, wore the same mask everywhere, just with different colors on it. But yeah, I like the guys who go like to the Flames and do a Flames-themed mask. I still, I'm still one of you know kind of show your team pride that way. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's it's cool I think to see Hiller in dark colored pads because I don't think there's any other goaltenders wearing pads like that in the league right now. I know, but you gotta figure that shooters would adapt to the white style pads eventually. So yeah, maybe throwing something different at them might work to Hiller's advantage who knows for sure yeah no it just it brings me back to like the mid 90s um and even early 2000s when everyone was wearing different colors and you know you'd have two goaltenders and they had a very distinctive pads and it just seems like over the last couple of years all the goalies have kind of lost that Id- that part of their identity if you will mm-hmm. so yeah that's cool um as far as you were mentioning how long the rotation goes i think the flames could keep the rotation going Oh, probably through November, and I think that'd be the latest that you'd be able to do it. Yeah, uh, I think by the end of our next homestand, which is middle of November, I think around the 20 game mark is pretty much where I'd have the cutoff. And if you haven't figured it out by then, (laughs) you know, either it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. (laughs) Yeah, and I don't think one guy necessarily needs to be the backup by then, but I think you need to... 
have a strategy of who's going to play where and not just alternating. You know, maybe one guy's going to get these three starts and the next guy will get the next ones, or one guy will start it, you know, on this home stand and the next guy will start on the road stand, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I think, like, if you go at the 20 game mark and then split the remaining 60 games, like, 35 25, I think that would be better. Yeah. And I still think that they shouldn't define a starting goalie. It should still be based on, you know, earn your way into that. So even if you say, yeah, one guy's going to get, you know, 30 games and the other guy's going to get the rest, that can still change who's getting the games where based on their performance. Exactly. Like if Ramo goes on a hot streak, well, you don't sit him just because, oh, it's Hiller's turn or vice versa. (laughs) But to me, it's really cool being a Flames fan having two goaltenders we can look to because for years it was always Kipper and whoever else they happened to bring in to back him up and we had some horrible backups there for a while yeah mediocre game costing goalie A B C (laughs) it's like where do you get these guys like is there nobody that actually knows how to tend net out there as a free agent yeah like get Scott Clemenson or something anything (laughs) well even guys like Leland Irving wouldn't have been bad for a couple years there yeah but yeah no I, I think that both goalies to me are looking good. Um, I also wouldn't be surprised to perhaps see one of them moved by the end of the season if they keep looking like they are. Yeah, and that's all just about maximizing an asset, really. Yeah, we we don't need, I mean, let's be honest, we don't need both goalies. And if we can get a great deal for one of them, and then we have a clear starter and a backup after that. Well, you also have to figure that Yanni Ordeo is on a one-way contract next year, so... He's likely penciled in as the backup. Yeah. So, it you know, if you're getting like a good second plus for one of the two goalies, then you have to look at it at the deadline. And about, well, maybe even before the deadline. I mean, about Christmas, January, oh, yeah. there always seems to be a team that loses their starter. Oh, yeah. Anytime that there's an opportunity between like Christmas at forward and it makes sense what you're getting in return, then... Yeah, you have to look at it. Yeah, I personally think that if we look at when, like, if you look back generally around Christmas, there's generally a big goalie trade. Christmas to about mid-January somewhere because somebody's lost a starter. And if I lost a starter, whose door would I knock on first? The guys that have two of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly, and we're pretty much the only market in town, so to speak. <laughs> and that could be how that could be how the starter is picked. It could be that these guys keep playing one and one until they decide, okay, this one's the guy we want to keep. Yeah, and it will likely be Hiller's thing, just because he has two years where Ramos a UFA, but that can change. Yeah, for sure. Hiller's also older, and if you're gonna invest in one of them, you'd probably want to take the younger one. Exactly. So, yeah, no... It it, it depends, like everything. Like, if, say, like, insert a playoff team name, and they offer you a first-round pick plus a good prospect for Hiller, and your best offer for Ramos a third, maybe you look at, well, is it really that much of a step-down type of thing? It just depends, like everything. (laughs) For sure. We're not in the front office, so we can't tell exactly what the trade offers are. So, <laughs> No, we, sh- we sure can't. And uh, like you said, only time will tell there. Exactly. If we need to hire, a, if we trade one of them and we need to hire a backup quickly, is Joey McDonald's not signed to an NHL deal, is he? Well, you can always go sign Martin Brodeur. That's true. I don't, I don't know. If he's been sitting out for half the year, I'm not sure I'd want to bring him in. True. The guy's probably going to be out of shape. But lots of goalies out there, especially at the AHL level. I pro- depending on how the AHL team is doing, I wouldn't want to bring Ordeo up mid-season to sit on the bench, but there's lots of options they could explore. Exactly. Like, there's always somebody that you could pick up for, like, a fifth or something. Sort of like uh, what Nashville did last year with uh, Dubnik or whatever. Like, there's always, there's always somebody available. Yeah, you'll find, you know, and there might be a goalie on waivers or a goalie you can get fairly cheap. There's there's always goalies kicking around, not top-notch goalies. Oh, no, just a fill-in guy. Yeah, there's always some goalies kicking around somewhere. Well, we've talked about the strength um, in goal, and I think the next big thing to chat about this week is the fact that the Flames are, for the first time so far this year, going to be forced to make a roster move. Um, David Jones will be returning tomorrow against the the Canadiens, which means that the Flames have to make a roster move uh, long-term. 
Mason Raymond is out, but not been put on the IR yet, so somebody has to go down to Adirondack at this point. If you were the GM and you had to send somebody down to the farm, who would it be right now? Reluctantly, Josh Juris, even though he's been fantastic in his call-up, uh, it's just he you don't have to wave him. Uh, if you're going on merit of play, it would be Devin Setaguchi, but you'd have to wave him, and there's likely some team that would claim him. Johnny Goudreau, Josh Juris, and Sean Monahan are the only forward, or the only players in this team that do not have to clear waivers to go down. Obviously, Monahan's not going down. They're probably not ready to end the Goudreau experiment yet. So yeah, it would make sense that Juris goes down. It, it's re- it would be disappointing though because Juris has looked like one of the top seven or eight forwards out there consistently every game. So maybe the Setaguchi experiment ends i don't know i would prefer setaguchi going because juris has looked so well well the other thing if you if you think about it with setaguchi is by sending him down on waivers he's then cleared to come up and down for i believe 30 days or 10 games so even if he clears we can bring him up and down easier as an injury replacement after that yeah, and it also wouldn't hurt having a guy like Setaguchi on Adirondack to help spark the offense. And speaking of which, uh, Adirondack is looking to get Corey Potter, who the Flames placed on waivers. He'll hopefully help solidify the defense core down there. So if within a week you got Potter and Setaguchi, you're adding a lot of veteran help to that team. Exactly, and a guy like Setaguchi might help guys like Reinhardt and Berchi break out of their scoring funk as they've only collected a pair of assists between them in their combined 16 games this season. Yeah. So, not very good. (laughs) To me, I'm not ready for the Flames to end the Josh Juris experiment. I think that he deserves to stay up here for a little bit. And if you are going on merit, which is what they said that they've been doing so far, he deserves to stay. I'm not sure as much as I think Setaguchi will probably be the guy to get sent down. I had another thought today, and there's one Flame that hasn't played since October 17th. So almost, what, a whole week he's been scratched, and that's Brian McGratton. And I'm wondering now, I, I think that McGratton would get claimed on waivers. But I'm wondering if that thought's going through management's head at all. Yeah, some team would definitely claim him because he is the best fighter in the league. So, do you want to lose that for the whole year? I don't know. You I traded Joe Piscola wouldn't. for him. Yeah, like I wouldn't want to lose that from our roster, even though I'm not overly a fan of that kind of guy. I think that he's become a fan favorite here. And even though I'm not a big fan of having a fighter on the roster, to me he's shown that he does have some offensive upside, and he's a good asset to keep on this team for when we need him. Even though he's been scratched for about a week now, I do believe that there are times in the year to play a guy like McGratton, and I wouldn't want to see him go down, but as a guy who's been you know, riding the pine for so long, the GM has to be starting to think that way, at least exploring it. Well, I don't think he really has a lot of offensive upside, but... It, for, a, for a tough guy, he does. I mean, he's not going to be a 10-point guy, but, you know, if we can get four or five points out of our tough guy... He's more there just to be a deterrent, really. You need to protect Goudreau, and having McGratton even as a threat... I don't know. I, I would rather get rid of Setaguchi than McGratton at this point, personally, if I was picking between the two. The only, yeah, and the big reason I agree with you is McGratton will not clear waivers. That's my thought. McGratton will get taken, and if we just want to give him up, we might as well try to trade him. I don't think we should give him up, but there's no reason to put him on waivers. If you have to send down a veteran, I think Setaguchi's the guy that if he did get claimed, we can live without him. Yeah, and you could probably get a decent pick for McGratton just because of the fact that he is the best fighter in the league. Probably. So, if you're looking at moving him, that would probably be the best route to go. Yeah. Like, even if you only got, like, a fifth round pick, that's better than losing him outright. I haven't looked at what teams have what kind of contract room or anything like that, but I think McGratton, had, or sorry, not McGratton, I think that Setaguchi at this point in the year could still probably clear waivers. 
Well, you also have to figure that he hasn't really done anything no, with he hasn't. us. And he didn't really do anything with Winnipeg. So teams are looking at him going, yeah, he did score 30 goals once and he hasn't done anything recently. So why would I waste the roster spot on so, him? So far, Setaguchi's played four games with the Flames, has zero points and is a minus two. Exactly. And, like, he was terrible last year with Winnipeg, so you're not getting a scoring assist there. He's just a roster spot, really. Yeah. And I think that the big reason I'd do it with Setaguchi is it, it gives you options. I mean, now you have a guy that can go up and down a little bit, so we're not forced to, okay, you know, Juris is playing well, but we have to send him down. By having Setaguchi clear, he can go up and down for a little bit. Yeah, and that would probably be the best thing because you're not telling all the other guys that oh well you're only coming up here for a week and you could score a hat trick and you're still going back down yeah you were a call up to fill a hole that's it that's yeah, how we look at you Juris scored a goal and he had a really nice assist on uh, Lance Boma's first goal of the year and has been quite effective even though he did get hit a couple of times by Orpik last game but you have to reward that and sending him down just because, oh, you're a rookie. I don't think that's the best message to send. So in comparison to Setaguchi, uh, Juris has also played four games, has one goal, one assist for two total points, and is a minus one. Well, the difference between them also is when they don't have the puck, Juris is a lot more composed oh, defensively. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So... You're getting that benefit as well. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you totally that these guys we bring up, if they're fighting for the spot and proving they should be here, they have to be given the chance to stay. They can't just be sent down because we got you from the farm, so we're going to send you back there. Exactly. Because like, if you got a guy like Furland and Grandland who are tearing it up in the AHL, you call them up and they actually start succeeding up here. Well, you can't send them back down. Like, that's not a good message to send. Yeah, and also stunts development. Exactly. And you would be better off than trading off the veteran guy or waving the veteran guy because they are showing that they're ready. And Juris has thus far shown that he looks like a solid NHL caliber player. Whether he keeps that up a month or two from now is still to be seen but you have to give him the opportunity to fail yeah for sure and and i agree with you i don't know if juris is going to keep doing this all season but we might as well ride him while he's hot and yeah i think that would be the ultimate thing for the front office this year is to have to make a move to keep a call up you know if they have to trade a veteran because they have this kid they can't afford to send down i think that's the position they would want to be in Exactly, and that's part of the rebuild, is having the young players come in and say, no, this spot's mine. And if Juris can do that, or Sven can do that, or any of these guys can do that, more power to them. Exactly, and you have to reward good things. And if they're doing good things, then you should keep them. And, <laughs> you know, to me, it's a lot better and having positive reinforcement than just, oh, well, you're a rookie, let's send you back down. Yeah. We'll see what they do. We'll see what move they make this week with Jones coming off the IR. Yeah. Who knows how long he'll be off the IR. The guy always seems to be hurt, so maybe, you know, he'll get hurt right away again. Who knows? But um, Mason Raymond is out, and all we know is an upper body injury. We don't know how long he's going to be out, do we? No, but he did look like he got knocked pretty good in the third period of the Caps game, so... I don't know. It looked somewhat serious, but not overly so. Yeah, I saw I saw the hit. I didn't see it in the game, but I went back and watched it after. And I agree with you. It looked, you know, not not like a really bad hit, but something that would have shaken him. And with four rest days this week um, and only two games, I wouldn't be surprised if he's back in the lineup by the time November hits. Yeah, I, I don't even think he misses the Halloween game even. They might keep him out as a maintenance move. There's no point in bringing him back in if he's not at 100%. We have other guys that can fill there. Oh, no. You don't rush guys just because, oh, we need you back. It's I, I just don't think the injury looked that serious. No. And you mentioned earlier uh, Corey Potter has been placed on waivers, so he's finally been moved off the IR. He was only here because he was injured and on the IR. 
And it was always the Flames' intention, I think, to send him down to the farms. Now he's going there. I don't think we're going to have a problem getting him through waivers. What about you? No. Like, if you look at teams that are lacking defensemen, there's still guys like Derek Morris, Ed Jovanovski, and a whole host of other more talented players. So why would you waste the contract even on claiming Potter? Like, Yeah. And it's too early in the AHL season to say, you know, we need this guy to bulk up our AHL team for a playoff run. Well, he would help solidify our farm team's defense. He'll definitely help ours, but I don't know if I was another GM that I would sign him this early or claim off waivers this early for that purpose. No, and realistically, it would, if you were going to do a move like that, you would sign one of the UFA better talented guys and send down one of your own players or that guy after the fact. So we'll probably see um, we'll probably see Potter clear no problem and go down and help Adirondack, which they need some help right now. Yeah, they're getting better, but still a ways to go. With the team healthy and both of us thinking that Juris stays here, do you think that Juris and or Goudreau's roles are going to change at all as we now have a healthy veteran lineup again? Not really. Goudreau's been fairly impressive now ever since he broke out in that Winnipeg game he's been more confident in the offensive zone and realistically if he was playing with legitimately talented star caliber forwards he probably would have a few more points because some of his passes just skipped on guys because they weren't or like they just didn't feel that that puck was coming to them and reacted a little late that's more on the his line mates than him bob harley was talking to the media the other day and mentioned that he wants to try juris at center so when you make those kind of claims i don't think you're planning to send the guy away anytime soon no um i think juris has a spot here i think his role may be diminished a little bit with brown coming back i think you might get or with jones coming back sorry i think that he might get uh, a little bit less ice time yeah but I don't think that they're necessarily going to banish him or put him in the press box or anything. I think both those guys still have spots in the team, but spots that are theirs to lose. Yeah, and I think the last game he was demoted down to, I think, the fourth line, third or fourth line, and put in a more defensive role, which that's good as well because you're getting to see if he can stick even in the third, fourth line role. So it, even if he is only getting seven or eight minutes a night, that's not necessarily a bad thing for him. Yeah, and especially with the way that Adirondack's playing right now, I don't think that he's going to benefit a lot from being down there playing more minutes. It's probably better to play less minutes in the NHL. Yeah, especially with the fact uh, that Adirondack has a lot of skilled forwards down there that are trying to figure out their own games. So yeah. having another body down there isn't necessarily going to help them either. Speaking of those bodies, um, Sven Berchi, Max Reinhardt, Bill Arnold, Corbin Knight, all down there, all players that we were expecting to see good things from, and still guys that are struggling. I know. What's up with that team, Matt? Well, they're a bit strange. They've been getting a lot of chances. They've run into some good goaltending and things are just not quite clicking where they should be and those four players that you mentioned have a combined one goal and four assists in all of the games that they've played and like that's not really acceptable to have each guy only getting one point it's really frustrating but it is early and like I know some people on Calgary Puck and other places are saying, oh, well, Sven's busting and this and that. If Sven was the only guy in that team who was stinking up the place, I'd say maybe. But the fact that whole team is awful, I don't think you can say that one guy's a bust and not the rest of them. Yeah, and realistically, the Flames down there only have three guys that are actually performing well. And that's Furland, Granland, and Waterspoon. Everybody else has been kind of bad, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And things just aren't clicking as they should be. But they're also learning a new system, and they're a very young roster. So growing pains are kind of to be expected. 
Yeah, I was going to say, Watherspoon, Furland, and Granlund are guys that have been around the Flame system for a little while now. So I can see that they're the guys that are adjusting better. That makes sense to me. Yeah, and honestly, each of those three guys will probably be our first three call-ups, depending on what we need. I'd hope so. Again, if we're rewarding the you know the players that are playing well, not only do you bring them up and reward them, but then you also give somebody down on the AHL team a chance to fill that hole and say, okay, you know, now uh, Furland is up in the NHL, so somebody needs to fill his role, and you might see somebody break out a little bit there as well. Exactly. And, like, for the first handful of games, uh, Sven was paired with Corbin Knight, and it seemed to hurt both of them, (laughs) which sometimes you just have absolutely no chemistry with a guy, and I think that's what their problem was. And now the lines have been switched up a bit, so we'll see if, uh, their latest offensive outburst, which they won their last game 7-3, if that will continue this week. They only played twice on Wednesday and Sunday, so it'll be interesting to see if they can break out of their little funk. Like, if at the 40-game mark, those four guys are, say, like, they only have 10 points each, then you get worried that, okay, yeah, something's wrong with those guys, but right now, it's just a bad slump to start the year. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way to look at it. I mean, the fl- the Calgary Flames have had worse slumps to start the year in the past. And we've also seen, you know, teams that with a new coach and with a new system having similar slumps at both the NHL and the AHL level. So I'm still chalking it up to this team being in, in a learning phase still. Yeah, and it's always disappointing when you're 2-6, and six, which I think that's what their record is right now. But it's early, and it is. you can't go, oh, the sky is falling just because they got off to a bad start. Like, teams in the NHL even get off to really horrid starts and then turn it around. It's just... Yeah, and they, can, and they have recovered. I mean, we've seen teams that have, you know, had like 1-9 and nine for their first 10 and made the playoffs still. Exactly, and... It's not the end of the world, and, and you also got to figure that once guys like Reinhardt and Berchi, who did put up so many points last year, once they start breaking out, then the wins should follow suit. It's just, right now, it's kind of difficult to watch. <laughs> yeah, and I think that Adirondack, I think a lot of people expected them to come out of the gates blazing because it's like, well, if we have a bad team in the NHL and we have lots of prospects, they should be doing good right away. But I agree with you. It's a slow start. Let's have this discussion again at the beginning of December and see how we're feeling. And if we're still talking about this team not being able to win a game, then there's serious problems there. Yeah, and then there's not just a player issue. It might be a coaching issue. But that's something to revisit down the road. Sometimes things just suck for a bit, and things turn around. It's not... You're preaching the choir here in Calgary, Matt. We know how that is. Yeah. So, it blows, but there's not much you can do about it. Hopefully, they start clicking and figuring out how to play with each other. And you also have to figure that the Flames down there, they're not a very veteran-laden team. So, that also hurts because you need to have some veterans in there and most of the Flames veterans are guys that aren't very offensively oriented either. Well, that's why I think a guy like Setaguchi and a guy like Corey Corey Potter going down could really help that team. Yeah, exactly, cuz it'll help stabilize things and all that fun. And, you know, as much as they're not an expansion, it's almost like having a new expansion team down there. I mean, all these guys are in a new city. We've got a brand new coach. We've got, you know, everything is new for this team um, moving from BC. So it's going to take some time even for these guys to, you know, get familiar with their arena and their home there. And I definitely think that it's it will turn around. It's just a matter of waiting and giving it time. And really... We, we don't need this team to look good now. I mean, we can wait for them. There's no disadvantage to waiting there. No, and the important thing is, are they learning? And are they listening to the new drills? Are they taking something from it? Yes, wins and losses would be, over losses would be better, but it's more important that they're improving their game. And like a guy like Sven Berchi, he has been 
working on his defensive game down there, and that it has been taken away from his offensive game, but in the long run, that might be beneficial for his career. I think also not just that they're learning, which is important, but I think the fact that the Flames organization is noticing that work and rewarding the guys with a call-up as well is going to be important because it shows that, hey, my work is paying off down here. Exactly. And like that's why like both Furland and Grandland, if more forwards either get shipped out or hurt, that like they should be rewarded for their strong play thus far. Yeah, and again, if we send somebody like Setaguchi down and he clears waivers, it gives us some freedom there to send guys up and down as we need to. Maybe we drop Juris back down for a couple games to bring somebody else up, just see what we've got there. Mm -hmm. Lots of things that they could be doing at this point. Exactly, like if Juris hits a wall up here, then you could send him down and call, say, Furland up, who plays kind of a same-ish role on the team, and plug him in and give him a shot that's one of the things that's so interesting this year is um the flames have so many options and so many things that they can do that we'll we'll see how how things go for them but i as we predicted earlier in the year i think we're gonna see a lot of guys run flaming seas this year yeah oh yeah Uh, i could easily see 10 plus players from the ahl get time up here even if it's only for a couple of games well, Matt, I think um, we should probably wrap up tonight with letting people know about the Peter Marr celebration. We talked a lot about Peter Marr last year after he retired. Uh, we had a friend of the show, Beasley, come on and talk to us, and uh, that was really well received by everybody. Everyone loved hearing Beasley's stories and memories. And November 18th at the game, uh, the Flames have said they're going to be celebrating Peter Marr. We don't know exactly what they have in store yet, but I still believe that if anyone deserves to be in the Forever Flame program, it's Peter Marr. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly there. I think it's a silly program for players. I still believe that jersey numbers should be retired, but that's a great program for guys like Marr who we can celebrate without retiring a jersey. Exactly, and the fact that he's a Hall of Famer and he's called pretty much every Flames game, you have to do something special, and I think the Forever Flame thing is appropriate and he should be celebrated in that manner. Yeah, and I mean, he's one of those voices, very similar to Ed Whalen, that Flames fans for generations are going to be remembering and passing down to their kids and that sort of thing. Ed Whalen has the Ed Whalen broadcast booth high above the ice in the South Dome. I wonder if we might see something um, named after Peter Marr as well. They definitely should. Is it the radio or the TV guys that broadcast out of the Whalen booth, do you know? I have no clue. So if it's TV, it would make logical sense that the radio one becomes the Peter Marr broadcast booth. Yeah, and that's only appropriate for all of that Peter has done for this franchise over the past decades. If we retire the jersey numbers of Hall of Famers, there's no reason that another Hall of Famer shouldn't somehow be raised to the rafters as well. I agree 110%. So we'll we'll see uh, we'll see what they do there. I'm quite excited that they're honoring him. Fi- not finally, but I guess it's felt like so long because we had the summer in there. But I'm glad they're going to be honoring him early in the year. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm definitely looking forward to giving him a standing ovation. That's going to be a long standing ovation. He w- he's well deserving of it. Oh, for sure. I mean, if if there's many people with this team right now in a non hockey role that are going to be remembered, it's going to be Pete, and his voice is going to live on. I've listened to some of the radio broadcasts this year, and as much as I like the new guy and think he's doing a good job, it's just, it's still not the same without Pete. No, exactly. And it'll take a long time for Flames fans to adjust to something different. (laughs) I imagine, I wasn't around them, but I imagine when Peter Marr came in, it took a while to adjust to him too. So, yeah, no, it's it's gonna it's gonna take some time, but I'm glad they're honoring him. Another voice change we've had at the Dome is uh, Flames' longtime anthem singer Heather Luciano's retired, and country, and country singer George Canyon uh, surprisingly took over. What do you think of George's uh, What do you think of George's renditions of the national anthem? I'm not a country fan, but he's done an all right job. I liked Liscano quite a lot, and I thought she was one of the best, if not the best, anthem singer in the league, so it'll take some adjustment. 
I don't know if Canyon's going to be a long-term guy, because I think he's on the tour next year. It, he's okay. Uh, he's more of a standard, average anthem singer. Well, he's, his anthem songs don't sound country, but I like having a male voice in there. I think that as much as I miss Heather and I thought she was really good, it's nice to have something different in there, and they didn't just replace her with a generic female voice. I think having the male voice is a nice change there. And if anything, like, if he doesn't return next year for the same job, then it gives the Flames a lot longer of a audition process for, like, more of a permanent replacement. Yeah, well, it gives him a year to find somebody. Exactly. And for a one-year deal, Canyon is more than acceptable, so... As a guy who's not a country fan, you've got to be hating the new intro video this year because they went with a country song on that, which really surprised me. Uh, I don't mind it as much. It's kind of fitting, in a way. Still don't like country that much, though. <laughs> I think the song is fitting, but it's just a weird thing. It's not the high-energy sound. You usually get to pump fans up and get ready for the game. Yeah, that's where country kind of doesn't fit, but it's fine. Well, anything else you want to chat about Flames-wise this week? Uh, not particularly. Uh, I just want to remind listeners about our call-in feature. Dan, can you give them some updates? Sure. If you go to firesidechat.ca slash conversation, or if you just go to firesidechat.ca and under the podcast tab on the main menu, you'll see a drop-down that will give it to you. And we invite you to join the conversation. We invite you to call in. Uh, we have a little form there where you can call in right through your computer. And we want you to give us your feedback on Peter Marr, uh, maybe what you think, if he should be a forever a flame, what you think of the games this week, uh, who you think the flame should send down, anything that's on your chest that you want to talk about. We want to get the Sea of Red involved. We want to get you guys on the show and giving us your feedback. So go to firesidechat.ca slash conversation and leave us a message because we'd love to get you on the show. Yeah, we always uh, like to have different opinions, not just bouncing back and forth between us. So come on, join in. And if you don't want to call in, we're, we'll also have a way on there that you can email us if you'd rather do that. Send an email, but uh, we'd love to hear some of the opinions from the Sea of Red. Um, get your questions, get your thoughts, and let's, let's make this show... Um, the voice of the fans. Let's get everybody involved here. Yeah, it'll be more interactive and interesting if we have people come on. Well, Matt, we got two games this week. One against the Habs uh, tomorrow on Tuesday. And then we have the Predators rolling back in on Friday. We've already beat the Predators this year. What do you think we're going to do this week for two games? How do you think we're going to end up? Well, Montreal is the best team in the league thus far, so... That'll probably be a tough game. Nashville, less so, but it's one of those things. I don't know. They've been off to a hot start. They might surprise and beat both of them. I think you might find the Habs are going to underestimate, as often happens with top teams. Yeah. It's one of those things that you never know. Hiller might stand on his head tomorrow or might let in five goals. You don't know. <laughs> so... And I think that even if Montreal beats us up, we still have a two-day rest before the Predators come. I'm expecting a win against the Predators and a loss against the Habs. Yeah. Either way, as long as they keep it up with their determined play, that's the most important thing. Even if they do lose both, as long as they're not getting skunked like we did to Carolina, then it's a good thing. <laughs> if someone would have told you before the season started that at this point we'd be fifth in the West, would you believe them? Yes, because of the fact that we got off to a hot start last year, so it's not entirely surprising that we're doing great off the bat. It's how November is going to be key for me. It's going to be a tough month for the team. Yeah, they play quite a lot next month, and other teams are starting to get back into the swing of things properly. They've got they got a five game road stand and then a five game home stand next month. Yeah, and I think that uh, teams, we're just catching them with our youthful enthusiasm where like they might not be ready right off the hop, so we'll as see. As much as we play, I'm just looking at the schedule, as much as we play a lot of games next month, we do have fairly good rest periods in there with big teams um, you know, having a day or two off. We only have one back-to-back, -back, which is until the end of the month. So as much as the road travel is going to hurt, it's not too bad of a schedule. 
Very regimented, though. Like, we play three Thursdays in a row and no Fridays. It's kind of a weird schedule. Yeah. Well, I think they're trying to conserve on travel as well, so... Which, that's good. It's just different, that's all. Yeah, it's going to be interesting having, you know, relying on having a game every Saturday that you can watch. Yeah. It's almost almost like uh, football. Yeah. Where the, you know, always know what day your team's going to play. Double headers, because that's pretty much when the Heat play as well. So Or the Ad- there you go. Adirondack Flames. Sit down on a Saturday and you can watch two Flames games in one night. Yeah. All right, Matt. Well, let's see how the Flames do this week, and I'll talk to you next week. Have a good one, everyone. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.